What experience made your blood run cold? Mundane, paranormal, or just plain terrifying, what happened? Like and subscribe or I'll haunt you tonight. Us kids were alone for the night at the hotel, waiting for our parents to get home, and our hotel room got a phone call. Must be mom and dad calling to tell us they're on their way from the bar. No, it was only like, 11 p.m. anyways. Way earlier than their 3 or 4 a.m. usual. It was a strange man, using a voice manipulator, who told my 13 years old oldest sister, I'm going to rape you, you should tell your mom that. And minutes later, a 12 inches wrench was thrown at the sliding glass door. Thank God it didn't break the door, just bounced back. Definitely should have called the cops that time. I'm surprised that out of the two couples that were on each side of us, who had also stepped outside with us kids, neither of them called the cops. Told our parents when they got home hours later, but they were drunk. I very clearly remember walking the wrench inside, feeling the weight of it, I am the 10 years old, and shaking it in my mom's drunk, half-litted face saying, they threw this at our door, to break it, to get to us. My sisters and I talked about this later on in life. We don't blame ourselves, but we deeply regret not calling the cops. Our parents were more than just drunk that night. Years ago, I visited a friend who had moved to a small town in northern Canada. We were going camping and meeting some of his friends. We left his place around 7, it was about a 2 hour drive to where we were going. Once you are out of the town limits, it gets pretty remote, very few cars etc. Nothing much between towns except forest. On the horizon we saw bright lights, I was excited as I have never seen the northern lights and I heard you could occasionally from the area we were in. Anyway, we stopped for maybe 10 minutes and carried on. We eventually pull into the campground and it was totally dark. No lights or lanterns anywhere, no fires. I thought maybe we went totty wrong spot. Eventually, we see a flash light and hear a tent unzip. It was one of his friends. He thought we bailed, so they went to bed. I looked at my watch because I thought it was a little lame they would be in bed so early, and it was midnight. We lost it conservatively two hours closer to three, no idea where the time went. We did not stop for more than 10 to 15 minutes and I am positive we left at 7. Still freaks me out to this day and we have no explanation. I have a lot, but the one I always come back to is my hallucination. When I was in 4th grade, I had lice. Because of this, I had to sleep on the floor so they wouldn't get in my bed. One night, I woke up at 3 am and rolled over. I was staring under my bed, it was bunk bed and I slept on the top bunk, and decided that was too creepy. I looked up in hopes of seeing something cute staring over the edge of my bed. But instead, I saw a man. He was crouching on my bed, staring down at me with these lifeless white eyes. What I will always remember about him is his skin. It was pale gray and looked papery. It was pulled tight on his thin body, I could see every vein. It was covered in these gray spots that resembled liver spots. I rolled over and refused to look at him for the rest of the night. When I woke up, he was gone. Every time I think of this story, of his empty eyes and his paper skin, I shudder. I'm sure it was just a hallucination, but still, a part of me wonders if he was real. I was traveling though Central America, won't say which country, but this could be any of them really. I was in a car with two other Americans driving along a country road at night. We were trying to make it to the next town to a hostel. Yes I know it's stupid to drive at night in a third world country, but we thought stopping in some randos field would be worse. We had no cell reception. This about about 12 years ago, I had some limited Spanish, and it was a rural part of the nation. No embassy or consulate anywhere nearby, or any expats either. A few miles outside of town behind us flares police lights. The local police pulls us over. I'm driving, my friends are also in the care, they don't speak much Spanish at all. It's four cops in a pickup truck, but cops in Central America are usually in combat boots with automatic rifles and sunglasses even at night. They had high intensity headlights on us, shouted I get out of the car. They didn't have their guns trained on us, but they were in hand, I comply. Their leader, I think he was a captain, walks up as soon as they see I'm a gringo. Flashlight in hand straight in my eyes. Every time I try to look away to shield my eyes, he snapped back to look at him. Police captain demands to see out passports and my driver's license. The thing is, I don't have a diver's license from this country. 
When I say this, he gets more intense, gives the passports to one of the other three officers who just takes them and walks back to the police truck. The captain starts grilling me fast and hard in Spanish. It was hard to keep up. I'm trying not to misspeak for fear they would mistake what I say. All questions about where did I get the car from, a local friend, did we steal it, why didn't I have a license, are we carrying drugs, did I know there were drug runners out at night, who I knew in down, did we really steal the car. He keeps going on and on about how serious it is to drive without a license in his country. He said they would have to impound the car, at least until it could be searched for drugs, we would have to go to the local jail. No we weren't allowed to call our embassy. No we couldn't get our passports back. I though they were gonna march us into the woods and kill us. But the weird thing is, the entire time this captain is accusing us of running drugs, stealing cars, and saying he'll jail us for driving without a license, his three officers look bored. Once they saw we were white, they slugged their rifles, and started smoking. The one with our passports didn't do anything but stand next to his truck, like he was waiting for the captain. All the while the captain kept saying how serious this situation was. But they weren't like searching the car or anything like a cop in the states would do if he suspected drugs. Then it dawned on my stupid gringo ass, the captain was stalling until I offered him a bribe. I mustered up my best friendly grino Spanish, and asked to go to my bag in the trunk with my wallet. There might be a driver's license in there. I get my wallet, and show him $40 American in it and say, is this enough to cover the license fee? He didn't see me palm the rest of the money out, plus I had other stashes, never keep all your money in one place when traveling. With that $40, the captain went from the biggest hard ass to the friendliest dude I ever saw. It was all how are you loving this country? Here are the local sites you need to see. I hope you have a good time, complete attitude 180. I couldn't see the other officers faces, but I'm sure it was a mixture of elation they got their beer money that night and that this stupid gringo overpaid on a traffic stop bribe. I had a huge sigh of relief. The police kindly drove in front of us and escorted us to the town and the hostel. I saw the captain again two days later in his truck with a few officers, he gave the friendliest wave I got the whole time in country. This happened when I was in 10th grade. We had a milkman who also used to bring his dog which was as big as a small bear and that dog used to enjoy sleeping under our car. So before leaving for school, I used to roll few stones under the car making sure none of them hit him, and shoo it away. A couple of months later, we had to shift into new apartments, everything was moved and only my dog was left at our old apartment. It was 5 am and as I was walking with my dog towards the new apartment, I heard a growl coming from some distance away, so I turned around and saw this dog running at full speed towards me. My knees and my back just froze, there were no stones or anything I could defend myself with and there was no way I was abandoning my dog. There was no way my dog could defend me as that dog was twice as big as my dog and his head was larger than my head. This whole time me and that dog had our eyes locked with each other while my dog took a piss at the lamp post behind me. After coming within a few feet of me, that dog jumped, opened his jaws while going for my neck. In my head I thought, so this is how I die, huh? Just as I lost all hope, I saw a black flash in the corner of my eye and the next moment my dog tackled him throwing him a couple of feet away. But this dog wasn't done yet, he circled behind me and jumped again going for the back of my neck, but this time my dog got his neck. The next moment was filled with that dog's screams and my dog's growls. He somehow managed to free my dog's grip and ran away with his tail between his legs. Haven't seen that milkman or the dog ever since. I had an experience during Hurricane Sandy that made my blood run cold. We'd lost power for a week, and all of our phones were dead. My family members decided they were going to go to a relative's house to charge up and shower, etc. This was during the time that I was rather into smoking, so I took it as an opportunity to have a nice smoke and enjoy the quiet house and read for a bit. I stayed home, so I take my dog for a walk, do my thing, everything is cool. It's pretty windy but no rain at the moment, and it's midday so the neighborhood is pretty empty with most people at work. As we approach the house, I notice a guy standing on the curb across the street from my house, wearing a scarf or mask covering the bottom half of his face and holding a chainsaw. Immediately, I get a little nervous because there's no one else around, and hello paranoia, but I don't think anything of it and keep walking towards the house. Just as I'm about to set foot on my property, he fires up the chainsaw and starts power walking towards me. Not quite jogging, but brisk, and right at me. 
I freak the hell out and hustle my poor old overweight dog into the house with my heart beating out of my chest. I barely make it and he zips past me into the backyard. At this point, I'm freaking out because I have no phone, the house phone is dead, and none of my neighbors are home, and my family isn't supposed to come back for a few hours. I stood midway between the back and front doors of the house armed with a kitchen knife for a good half hour, while my guardian angel dog who clearly sensed my distress barked at this chainsaw dude. He eventually went away, I have no idea where, since I resorted to hiding at that point. Later was informed by my hysterically laughing family that he had come to get rid of a tree that had fallen in the backyard. Why no one told me, and why he basically lunged at me with an active chainsaw, is a mystery to me. But yeah, definitely thought I was gonna die that day. When I crashed my car back in 2010. I was on a dirt road going about 60, hey dang it, 9 feet tall, bulletproof and invincible, and I hit a pothole. The back end of the car kicked up, and sent the car into a sideways drift. In that instant, it hit me that I was in some serious thing. The primal fear of what I'd just gotten myself into kicked, and I experienced time dilation. Everything appeared to be moving at half speed, and I could see there was absolutely nothing I could do to recover the situation. The car violently swerved back the other way, and was headed directly towards a huge white pine tree with a bunch of thick dead branches hanging off it. I cranked the wheel as hard as I could to try and get one more swerve out of the car and avoid becoming shish kebab man. The car entered a small ditch right in front of this tree, and the rear wheels got hitched to a culvert. This pole vaulted the car straight up, and away from the tree at a slight angle. Now, this is where time really slowed down. I was upside down, 10 feet in the air, flying into the forest at Mock Jesus. I could see the sun through the branches, and little pools of light in the vegetation. I also saw where I was going to land, on a massive boulder. The slow motion sensation left, and my car smashed into this boulder upside down, crushing in the entire roof, aside from the driver's side. The car rolled down the boulder and landed right side up. I'm pretty sure I blacked part of this out, but I just remember snapping back into reality convinced I'd been seriously injured. There was absolutely nothing wrong with me. Not even the slightest indication I just neoed my way around death. My best friend was driving behind me and came sprinting up to the car, also convinced I was dead. He saw me looking around, and kicked the door off and started checking for injuries. He told me not to move anything until paramedics got there to assess me. I didn't really register much, aside from how lucky I'd gotten. I didn't really eat or sleep much the next week either. This also happened to be one of the few times I'd ever decided to wear a seatbelt. That, no doubt, saved my life. What also got to me was if I'd had any passengers, they would have all died. The only part of the car that didn't resemble crushed aluminum foil was the driver's seat. That's what hit me hardest, my best friend who ran to check on me, that I'd known since preschool, could have easily been sitting beside me, a victim of my stupidity. Now I buckle up and drive like a granny. I might get there late, but at least I'll get there. Getting laid off without warning, it had been a bad week. A slacker of project manager, who had been delaying this pointless project, suddenly was given an ultimatum that it was due Monday. It was Wednesday, I was the only Linux admin the company had, so I had to work 5 12-hour days, through the weekend, and we actually pulled it off. We had a working ecosystem of a shaky Rube Goldberg messaging CMS system that no one would ever use, using no less than 12 virtual systems to essentially run a website. We had reinvented Drupal, I still got kudos and hearty handshakes. A meeting was scheduled at 2 p.m. with the security team to go over some of the highlights, only it turned out the security was for me. Without warning, I was told my position had been eliminated. I was given a generous severance, my boss couldn't look me in the eye, and the CTO gave me an apology and huge letter of recommendation. I was out the door less than 30 minutes after the kudos and handshakes, no warning. Everyone I had worked with for years was shocked, what? Wait, why? The company essentially shot itself in the foot in a cost-cutting move. Long story short, the new president of the board of directors had made the decision because he didn't know what a Linux admin was. He thought I was a Linux admin, and since they contracted out HVAC, he saw no need for me. He also later laid off the entire HR department, and the head of PR because she explained the declining magazine sales on the internet, and wanted to move in that direction. Crazy, but the timing was horrible for me. My wife had died less than a year previously, representing a 40% drop in household income, 
and I lost my health insurance with diabetes and a heart condition. I took me two months to find a new job, and I nearly died off my meds, which on Cobra or not, are way way out of affordable range. I woke up groggy having had the most intense dream of evacuating the library building where I worked, it was on fire and the fourth floor was overtaken with flames which were spreading down to the third floor. I went to my computer and my friend piped up on AIM, it was around that time, is your building covered in ash? Turned out a large apartment building about half a block away from the one I lived in had burned during the night that night, in the exact pattern that I had dreamed the library burning in. Some of my friends living nearby had to evacuate as flames were menacing out of the windows toward their building. I opened the window and smelled char. I hadn't had any indication that that had happened while I was sleeping until my friend messaged me, still feels creepy. No one was harmed in the fire, though images of what looked like the silhouette of a person standing in a window surrounded by flames were circulated afterward. The building sat in various stages of abandonment and redevelopment until it was reopened about 10 years later. I had a pretty paranormal and terrifying experience about a month ago. I know it will sound far-fetched, but I tell you it's true, sorry for the long story. So I work a pretty bad job at a restaurant bussing tables all day and it's repetitive and not enjoyable at all. So I get home on Sunday after my shift and immediately go down to take a nap. Now keep in mind, I started this nap in the middle of the day. I wake up about 10 hours later and it's completely dark out and eerie. Now at the time of this event, I wasn't really fond of my parents as they both were really strict and took away my privileges often. This time, they took my phone. So I'm laying there trying to fall back asleep while facing the wall, my back is to the rest of my room, when I physically feel a cloud of darkness and despair fall on me. Like the previously moonlit corner I was in became shrouded in darkness. After the darkness fully surrounds me, I proceed to receive these horrible and disturbing visions that I knew I could never imagine myself. I felt like the devil himself was trying to telepathically speak with me. I heard a voice promising me power and all I had to do was kill the parents I supposedly hated. And I imagined a long black arm painting a symbol on my forehead. I eventually shook off this feeling of dread with enough concentration, but afterwards, I felt like there was something behind me in my room. Like the manifestation of all my fears was there behind me. After about 30 minutes of fear and panic, I gained the courage to turn around and look. Obviously, there was nothing there. But I still felt very uneasy and I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. When I was in high school, my friends and I decided to go to this cemetery that was allegedly haunted by a little girl. We didn't really expect to see or hear anything, it was just something to do on a Friday night. I'll be the first to admit it was pretty spooky getting to the cemetery because we had to leave our car behind and walk through a forest trail to get to the gates. The only thing we had to guide us was the night vision on my camera and the lights from our phones. Once that was over with it was back to joking around and laughing as we walked through the tombstones. The first thing that was sort of off that happened was when we were in the back of the cemetery, one of my friends noticed that there were what looked like flashlights at the entrance where we came from. We naturally thought they were cops or something and hid behind some tombstones. When I personally looked, I swear they were orbs like how people always capture on pictures and videos. I only thought that in my head and my friends sort of convinced me that they were flashlights, so I didn't really fret about it. After the light seemed to disappear, we decided to call it a day and head back to the car. Here's the moment that I lost my mind. As we're close to the exit of the pitch black forest trail, me and one of the guys were sort of ahead of everyone else by about 50 yards. As we're mid-conversation, we both hear coming form the forest to our left side a little girl laugh, clear as day and close as hell to us. We both look at each other wide-eyed and both say, no freaking way, and we sprint the rest of the way to the car. When we were all calm and collected I asked him, even though it sounded exactly like a little girl, if he was the one that made that noise somehow and he denied it. That's the only paranormal thing that has happened to me in my life and always gives me goosebumps whenever I think about it.